Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephania Cox. Here are today's top stories. From sea to shining sea, America commemorates those who sacrificed for the nation's freedoms. We bring you our Memorial Day special coverage. New documents raising concerns about the way Google collects user location data. We'll tell you what employees said about the company's practices. Republican lawmakers introduce a bill that would prevent American embassies and consulates from flying political flags. That's as several diplomatic missions displayed the Black Lives Matter flag on the anniversary of George Floyd's death. Within four days this month, one small county at the U.S.-Mexico border caught thousands of illegal immigrants, which ended up being more than the co- country's county's entire population. A rancher shared with us his fears and concerns. China finally allows couples to have up to three children, but the major policy shift meets with mixed reactions. Memorial Day is a time to honor those who have died in service to the United States. We take a look at how those in the nation's capital commemorated this time. NTD Steve Lance has more from Washington, D.C. In honor of Memorial Day, President Biden, Vice President Harris, and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin visited the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at the Arlington National Cemetery. Biden gave a speech to honor the soldiers who never made it home. He also spoke of how Memorial Day originated from the Civil War and reminded us that many Americans gave up their lives fighting for the freedom for their fellow countrymen. We all know Memorial Day origins lie in the wake of the Civil War. A war for the freedom of all, a war for union, a war for liberty. Over the weekend, Vice President Harris came under fire for posting a picture of herself on Twitter with the caption, enjoy the long weekend. Some people said the vice president was tone deaf. The national holiday is to honor and remember fallen soldiers. But on Sunday, she sent out another tweet to honor the nation's servicemen and women. As for the events, the National Memorial Day Parade in Washington took more of a hybrid virtual route this year. But there were other in-person events throughout the weekend, like the Rolling to Remember Motorcycle Rally, which brought people from all over the country to honor prisoners of war and the veterans missing in action. I came up as a patriotic American in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, honoring gentlemen like this that came home from Vietnam. One man at the motorcycle rally said this holiday is important for Americans because it's a time to remember those who sacrificed for our freedoms. So, you know, Memorial Day is a big day for us also. This year's National Memorial Day Parade in Washington, D.C. was pre-recorded a few weeks earlier. The event wasn't open to the public at the time of filming, but will be aired on certain television networks until the 4th of July. A local says it's time to open up. It's time to open up. It's time. So if you ask me, should they have had a parade? Yeah, they should have. Morally, I feel satisfied that it's time to move forward and to kind of get back to life. Americans throughout Washington, D.C. remain hopeful that next year all of the events honoring this important day will be back to normal. Steve Lance, NTD News, Washington. Around 500 people gathered at D.C.'s Vietnam Memorial Wall today to honor the lives lost in that war. Although that's only a quarter of the 2,000 in attendance compared with past years, those who did come said they were thankful to have the chance. NTD's Molina Wise Cup brings us more. Nearly 60,000 names are inscribed on the shiny black wall, and more than half are veterans who sacrificed their lives at age 18 or younger. Many Vietnam veterans could have landed alongside those honored on this wall today, but they say they don't regret the risk. I just think we live in the greatest place in the world, and any time they need the young men to step up, step up and do it. Uh, I, was, I was very satisfied. I was in the military for 36 years, and so uh, I had a, a great understanding and a very strong like for being in the military. Vietnam veteran and now best-selling author Carl Melantis said he chose to risk his life for America's founding values, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But he made it clear that when Thomas Jefferson wrote happiness, it didn't have a superficial or materialistic meaning. He didn't mean that feeling you get when daddy buys you a new car. It meant thriving and fulfillment 
but I would definitely risk my life if there was any government that tried to stop me from reaching my human potential. This Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall has been here for nearly 40 years, honoring the lives of over 58,000 Vietnam veterans. Each name has inscribed beside it either a cross standing for those veterans who are missing in action or MIA, or a diamond representing those who have lost their lives from the Vietnam War. In 2020 and in 2021 total, there were five uh, name additions added to the wall. We did not have a ceremony last year, so we are, are recognizing those today. The families of those five veterans were called up one by one and recognized by hundreds of people. The attendees paid their honor and respect to those who risked their lives for American values. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And a Memorial Day ceremony was held at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum complex to honor those who served in the armed forces. NTD's Jason Perry has that story. Servicemen unfurled a 100-foot-long American flag next to USS Intrepid. Rear Admiral Charles Rock, who is a native of New York State, explained that those who made the ultimate sacrifice did not die in vain. America's legacy is a direct result of the sacrifices of those who have given their lives in service of our nation. Their sacrifices helped to build the foundation for freedom and democracy around the world and instill hope for a better life for all people. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio's father served in World War II and he carried home physical and emotional scars from the war. But I could see for him there was something a hollowness because he couldn't get out of his mind. His comrades in arms didn't come home. The ceremony was concluded with the laying of four ceremonial wreaths and a three volley rifle salute. We spoke to some of the veterans at the Memorial Day service to find out what they did in the military. I was a photographer's mate third class on board. That's why I take pictures. All right. And I'm a volunteer on the Intrepid. I was a machinist mate second class or machinist repairman, second class, aboard the ship. We did all the uh, work on the every helicopter that the Army had at that time, between uh, 1966 to 1972. I was an aviation supply technician. I basically supplied aircraft parts to uh, squadrons for aircraft. We put data into computers for in a personnel company with the enemy three miles away. <laughs> it's, it's very highly technical, but you know, it's still war, you know, so. Due to the pandemic, many of the Intrepid Museum's programs for veterans were moved to online. Now on Memorial Day, they're happy to announce that the Intrepid Museum is once again open to the general public. Jason Perry, NTD News, New York. And people celebrated Memorial Day and ceremonies all across California including on an aircraft carrier ship. NTD's David Lamb brings us more. Hundreds attended the ceremony aboard the USS Hornet. The ship was commissioned in November 1943. Speakers talked about the ship's legacy and their roles as veterans. The USS Hornet was awarded 11 battle stars for service in World War II. It also served in the Vietnam War and even recovered the Apollo spaceflight landings. Here on the ship, we learned and we improved. The strength of the military today in all branches oversees any other country. We're the strongest nation in the world. Fee is best friends with a fellow Navy veteran, Louis Ross, who joined the Navy when he was 17 years old. Ross recommends young people join the Navy because he learned a lot in his 30 years of experience. The Navy taught me electronics, taught me how to repair, taught me how to troubleshoot taught me how to stay with the project. And that's the best thing I can say about the Navy, uh, is I was told, you know, you need to finish a job, and by God, I'm never, I'm never gonna go back on my word, and I'm always gonna do my best to finish a job. Memorial Day is pretty significant uh, for us. One of our responsibilities is that we help family members uh, come to terms uh, with the deaths of their loved ones, and, and to walk them through that process and to help them through that. Other parts of California are also paying tribute to veterans this Memorial Day. In. Fire. Today is a very special day for America. In Los Gatos Memorial Park, you could hear patriotic and inspiring music while veterans were recalling their military experiences. And not only were people celebrating 
the fallen heroes, but also memorializing all the ones that sacrifice and risk their lives to defend the country. You got to uh, honor the heroes, the fallen, that never came home, hundreds and thousands of our sons and daughters that never came home, so it's very hard. We remember that they left us their legacy to guide us, to strive for. And on this and each Memorial Day, I miss my son, as I'm sure every family misses their soldiers as well. One veteran recently volunteered for the California State Guard, and he is 74 years old. We support the 129th uh, Air Rescue yeah. Wing out at Moffitt. Yeah. So well, one, it's fun, fun being active again, if you will. Entity asked one family what type of values a soldier should have. I would say that they love grateful. America and they're grateful for the opportunity that America affords all of us. And they're givers, people that are willing to give for everyone else. Yeah. Bravery, self-sacrifice, commitment, mm -hmm. and honor. Memorial Day was declared a national holiday 1971 and was originally called Decoration Day. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Memorial Day weekend can be a painful time for veterans and their families as they think about those who passed away. One Iraq War veteran wrote a song of inspiration to help uplift and inspire fellow veterans this weekend and beyond. NTD Sapphire Quarter tells us more about the veteran anthem. Give me a mission. While serving in Iraq, Dakota Swan created a choir. The choir, I saw that um, music was something that we could all connect to and it, it kept us inspired, it kept us sane. After her service, Swan joined the suicide prevention team at the Georgia Department of Veteran Services. She wanted to help all veterans struggling with mental illness. She thought of a way. I'm still she wrote the veteran anthem. The lyrics, you know, you know, give me a, a purpose, give me an, a, an assignment, give me a mission. I'm, I'm still worth it. Um, I'm still your protector. I'm still your winner. And those are words that veterans need to hear at a time where they feel down. She says those lyrics are important because veterans can have a hard time finding purpose after they leave the military. She says in the military there's always a mission, always someone to tell you what to do next. Civilian life is a different story. There's no one around to say something to you about here's your mission today, here's your purpose today, and you're just in a very lonely place. place. It can be even more lonely during Memorial Day weekend when veterans think about fellow soldiers who have passed or those who have lost their battles with mental illness. She hopes the anthem will help them find purpose after service. Okay, you know what? Yes, I, people do need me. I am still supposed to, supposed to be here. I do have a life outside of the military. The song can also help friends and family of those who have served understand what veterans are going through and how to help. Sapphire Quarter, NTD News. A group of people in Jupiter, Florida, just north of West Palm Beach, held a unique Memorial Day parade. Rather than marching through the streets, they took to their boats and set sail. Nice boats, good weather. But people here had other reasons to come together. It's very, very important. It's a, it is a sacred day to remember everyone who gave their lives for the freedom of this country that's being taken advantage of right now, actually. With that in mind, the people enjoyed their day. The parade? Uh -huh. Beautiful. Beautiful day. Uh, beautiful boats. Beautiful weather. Uh, beautiful people. Great to be in Florida. The attendees expressed loyalty, not only to their country. Very exciting to see all of the support for Trump, of course. So, yeah, very happy to be here. Well, we come here, we're Trump supporters, we love him, and, and uh, we want him back. 
The parade was on its way to Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence as the final stop. Supporters say they hope the procession will send a positive message. Remind people what it's about, and it's really about like the people who gave their lives for us to live free. I think probably half of the country have forgotten. <laughs> I think the liberal half has forgotten about the meaning of the, of the holiday, yes, absolutely. Jupiter, Florida's activities on Monday, concluding an entire weekend dedicated to Memorial Day. The Attorney General of Arizona has updated its lawsuit against Google. Now he's alleging the tech giant is collecting users' location data even after users turn off tracking on their smartphones. NTD's Kevin Hogan brings us the details. New documents submitted by Arizona Attorney General Mark Burnovich raise questions about the way Google handles users' location data. The documents show emails between Google engineers. One employee allegedly said, so there's no way to give a third-party app your location and not Google? This doesn't sound like something we would want on the front page of the New York Times. In 2018, the Associated Press reported that many Google services on smartphones store location data even when users explicitly tell it not to. Another Google employee allegedly stated, I agree with the article. Location off should mean location off, not except for this case or that case. The lawsuit says Google benefits significantly from the location data it collects. That's because the company makes most of its money from ads, and when it collects location data, it can tell clients how effective their ads are by tracking in-store visits. Brnovich told Fox News, The fact they are trying to hide what they are doing, they are being sneaky about it, and using every trick in the arsenal to stop this from seeing the light of day is all consumers need to know about Google's intentions. A Google spokesperson said the attorney general's lawsuit has mischaracterized their services. He said the company has always built privacy features into their products and has robust controls for location data. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. The Pentagon just confirmed radar footage showing at least nine UFOs swarming a U.S. warship. That's after the footage was made public by a UFO expert. Let's take a look at the footage. In a video posted by investigative filmmaker Jeremy Corbell, you can see a group of unusual aircraft on the radar. They show up as dots on the screen surrounding the ship. You can hear one operator saying the speed of the objects going from 46 to 50 knots, then it speeds up to 138 knots, equal to nearly 160 miles per hour. A Pentagon spokesperson told an NBC correspondent, I can confirm that the video you sent was taken by Navy personnel and that the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force included it in their ongoing examinations. And Republican lawmakers introduced a bill that would prohibit U.S. embassies and consulates from flying political flags. That's after Secretary of State Antony Blinken authorized diplomats to fly Black Lives Matter flags. NTD's Christina Kim has that story. A bill called the Stars and Stripes Act of 2021 aims to limit the types of flags that would be allowed at U.S. embassies and consulates to six kinds, effectively banning the display of flags that are deemed political. This comes as a number of U.S. embassies and consulates flew the Black Lives Matter flag on the anniversary of George Floyd's death. The U.S. consulate in Thessaloniki, Greece, for example, raised the BLM flag on its official flagpole just under the American flag. They said the move was to honor Floyd and stand in solidarity with other nations to advance racial justice, a key priority within U.S. foreign policy. And the U.S. embassy in Athens, Greece, posted a video showing the BLM flag hanging over top of the official embassy seal. A State Department memo gave chiefs of U.S. diplomatic missions the OK to display BLM flags and banners. Co-sponsor of the bill, Republican Conference Chair Elise Stefanik, said the flag of a political organization founded by Marxists shouldn't be flown at American embassies. That's in reference to the co-founder of BLM saying that her and her fellow organizers are trained Marxists. But those in support say the term Black Lives Matter advances racial equity and access to justice. Representative Nicole Maliotakis, who introduced the bill, says the American flag is a beacon of freedom and hope for oppressed peoples around the world. And that's why it should be the primary flag flown above American embassies. Christina Kim, NTD News. 
A concert in Florida has a special ticket discount, but only for those who have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Concert goers who show proof of vaccination and who received their final shot on or before June 12th will be eligible for the discounted tickets. For this group, tickets are $18 in advance or $20 at the door. But for those who haven't gotten the vaccine or haven't gotten their second dose, the price increases by 50 times. They would need to pay a whopping $1,000 for the same ticket. The promoter who came up with the idea said they're just trying to do a show safely. But one fan who wanted to go to the concert told WFTS this is a terrible idea not because, because not everyone can get the vaccine. Adding she already has antibodies after recovering from the virus, but vaccine passports are banned in Florida. Governor Ron DeSantis recently doubled down on the state's stance, saying they'll enforce Florida law. And living on a ranch is an American dream for some, keeping to yourself and working hard. But down at the U.S.-Mexico border, some ranchers are getting unexpected visits from trespassers. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on that. Cole Hill has a wife, three kids under 10, and a ranch in Kinney County, Texas. Um, we've lived here for about six years now. Over the years, immigrants have illegally crossed the border and trespassed onto his ranch. But he said the problem worsened this year and shared about an encounter in February. My wife called me and said, hey, you need to get home right now. We've got, uh, we've got a bunch of illegals here at the house. These men had surrounded my house. They were banging on my back door. They were banging on my front door simultaneously. They were looking through our windows in my daughter's room, in my, in my little boy's room. Hill made it back and found a man on the front porch. Others went into hiding. Eventually, he managed to get them off his property. Border Patrol, he says, arrived an hour later. It's a very scary situation knowing that we're this far out. Um, we shouldn't have any trespassers on our property. We are way out in the middle of nowhere. Others are reporting similar experiences, including property damage dealt by trespassers. Kinney County was one of the first counties to declare a local disaster last month over the border crisis. Their border patrol sector caught more illegal border crossers than the county's population in a span of four days this month. That's over 3,400. Hill blames the Biden administration's stance on immigration for the surge in border crossings and the impact it's having on Texans. So as far as what we can do, I would say we just keep keep trying to do things the right way and uh, and get our, our the people who we elected into the positions to secure us and and, uh, and our border and provide American citizens with a safe way of life. He says he reaches out to elected officials as often as he can in hopes of finding a solution to this problem. The Texas governor is vowing to call a special legislative session. That's in order to get the Texas House to pass a major election reform bill. Texas Democrats blocked the bill by walking out of the state capitol right before its deadline. NTD's Allison Lee has the latest. Texas Governor Greg Abbott is promising to declare a special session for his state's legislature and add a sweeping election reform bill to the agenda. This after Texas House Democrats blocked the bill by walking out of the House chamber in large numbers late Sunday night. We denied them the quorum that they need to pass this bill and we killed that bill. In response, the governor writes, I declared election integrity and bail reform to be must-pass emergency items for this legislative session. It is deeply disappointing and concerning for Texans that neither will reach my desk. He hasn't stated when the special session will be, but he says legislatures will be expected to have worked out the details when they arrive at the Capitol for the special session. The Texas Senate passed the bill early Sunday morning, and for it to reach the governor's desk, the Texas House has to pass it before the current legislative session ends on May 31st. The House requires at least 100 of its 150 members to be present to conduct business. By abandoning the House floor Sunday night, Texas Democrats prevented the bill from passing this legislative session. Based on the tally sheet furnished by the voting clerk, a quorum is apparently not present. The point of order is well taken and sustained. 
The election bill would grant greater access for poll watchers, penalize election workers that send unsolicited ballots, ban drive through voting, and ban vote tabulators that can connect to the Internet by 2024. It would allow voters to vote after polling time if they were already lining up at polling stations when the polls close. The bill would also allow a judge to void election results if the room of fraud is enough to change the results. Republicans support the bills, saying it would keep Texas elections fair and honest. Texas Democrats oppose the bill, claiming that it suppresses minority voters. Allison Lee, NTD News. A retired Chicago firefighter started a nonprofit program to get at-risk youth off the streets and learning practical skills. His goal is to help give them a better chance in life. But he tells NTD of the program's struggles during the pandemic. Kenneth Trotter opened Mach 1 Mentoring in 2014. The program teaches basic auto mechanic skills to at-risk youth. I've seen a lot of young men and women on the streets and, you know, going, fighting a war that they just couldn't, you know, you just couldn't understand it. They didn't know why they were doing it. Most students come from low-income families. Enrollment in the program is tuition-free. Trotter tells NTD the value of their hands-on learning. Once you teach them that, they turn into little monsters. They love it because they've achieved this. And once they learn it and understand it, they're all over the shop. Trotter served for 27 years as a lieutenant with the Chicago Fire Department. He says that this is just another way of serving the community. I'm trying my best to make it as easy as possible for the students to be able to come in here and learn skills that will give them a better chance in life. Because of the pandemic lockdown, Trotter nearly closed his shop. The program had to reduce its number of instructors from 10 down to 3. We have uh, one student that graduated out of our program and uh, went to Lincoln Tech and graduated from there. And now he is, uh, he works for O'Reilly's and he's a manager. And it all started from him being in this program. And it's a good thing for the kids to learn because they get to work with the hands, the mind, the knowledge. And the upkeep of the older vehicles. They're knowledgeable about cars and engines, transmissions, rear ends, brakes, um, cooling system, electrical systems, because those are the things that we teach. We teach everything from general maintenance to full auto restoration. The program provides a varied collection of old cars for the students to work on. Its slogan is, old cars save young lives and young lives revive old dead cars. It's so deep in our heart that we're really trying to be here for our youth just to, you know, help them have a better chance at life. But I can't do it by myself. Trotter says more youth are showing interest in Mach 1 mentoring, but he now struggles to keep his program open due to lack of donors and sponsors during the lockdown. Nonetheless, he will continue to persevere. Up next, China relaxing its two-child policy. Couples can now have up to three children. And here's how Chinese residents react. And CCP virus cases are surging in South China's most populous city. Authorities locked down two neighborhoods and canceled over 500 flights in response. More on that on NTD News. There's cultures that have been lost, but this culture hasn't been. The artist is showing us our sense of who we are, where we came from. You look at his hat. His hat is knitted probably by a man because a man traditionally knitted the hats. That hat tells you the story of who this person is, what his place in the culture is, the animals around him. Everything's all contained in the messages in the hat. And the tool that he's carrying over his shoulder. This is a centuries old tool that has been able to rework the mountains. 
Those traditions are invaluable, and if we don't honor those traditions, then we're rootless. The artist is showing us the value of maintaining our culture and respecting our culture. China is relaxing its two-child policy, and now couples can have three children. This comes as the country is facing a sharp decline in birth rates. But Chinese residents are having mixed reactions. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has the details. Beijing's latest policy shift has prompted a range of reactions from Chinese residents. One tourist couple in Shanghai said they'd only have more kids if conditions allow for it. Nowadays, young people have to buy a house. This amount of pressure is already huge, and then you have to consider the cost of the child's education, etc. I think this sort of policy will be difficult to implement. Right, and we think the quality of education for our children might be an even bigger issue for having a second or third child. On Chinese social media platform Weibo, internet users are hotly discussing the new policy. A new hashtag has already attracted over 400 million views. It reads, what do you think of the three-child policy? The reactions are mixed. Some are positive, but the majority seem less than favorable. One person posted that they support the policy, adding that as long as you're a Chinese person, you should support the state's three-child policy. Others are questioning the cost that comes with raising three children. One internet user said, how many people nowadays can afford to raise three children? Another person wrote, I am the second child in my family and I'm 35 years old. I'm a girl and my brother is 10 years older than me. After I was born, the government fined us to the point of almost bankrupting my family. Can the state return the fine to us with interest? I can't even afford to raise my single child right now. The cost of raising one child plus housing loans is over $1,500 per month. And me and my husband are working extremely hard to make money. We also have to take care of our elderly parents who have ailments. Where is the support from the government? The Chinese regime said it would provide supportive measures, but hasn't given any details. Another internet user complained about the policy shift. She wrote, what was the regime thinking when it only allowed one child? Those of us that were born in the 80s are just miserable. We grew up lonely, without any siblings. And now one couple has to raise four elders in the family. Now the government allows us to have a third child. So that means two people have to take care of four elderly parents and three children. Can you let us survive? And it's not just Chinese residents who are questioning the policy. Unless the government introduces real incentives, so providing special allowances to couples who have three children, like a you know, reduction for transportation uh, and other incentives, uh, I don't think that Chinese couples are going to have more kids in the coming years. The policy is an effort to save the country's declining birth rate. In 2016, the Chinese Communist Party dropped its one-child policy, allowing couples to have two children. But it doesn't appear to have worked. Census data shows that 12 million babies were born in China last year. That's an 18 percent decline from the year before. It remains to be seen how effective the three-child policy will be going forward. South China reported a sudden surge in CCP virus or coronavirus cases on Monday. Authorities reported around 20 new local cases in Guangdong province. NTD cannot independently verify the number, but it may be underreported as the Chinese regime has a history of covering up virus cases. Chinese state-owned media reported that the authorities found most of the officially reported cases in Guangzhou. That's the capital city of Guangdong province, and also the most populous city in South China. Among the patients in the province, authorities found both the UK variant and the Indian variant. Both can spread faster than the other strains found before.
So far, local authorities have placed two neighborhoods in Guangzhou under lockdown. Only one person from each household is allowed to go out to get groceries each day. But most shops there are reportedly closed. Only some supermarkets are still open. Because of the surge in cases, airports in the region had to cancel about 500 flights as of Monday morning. All travelers taking long-distance buses to other provinces have to show a negative virus test from within 72 hours. This aims to reduce trips between provinces. Local residents can't be seen crowding on the streets to undergo mass testing. Coming up, thousands of demonstrators marched through London to protest against lockdowns and vaccine passports. And one London company is selling kits to make any bicycle electric. That and more on NTD News. The European Commission proposed Monday that fully vaccinated people should be exempt from testing or quarantines when traveling from one EU country to another. The EU executive branch made the recommendation for people who are fully vaccinated 14 days prior to travel, at least. The Commission is also proposing that more reliable but more expensive PCR tests should be valid for 72 hours and rapid antigen tests for 48 hours. And they say children who are not yet in line for vaccinations should not have to undergo a quarantine if traveling with parents who are exempt. These latest proposals mirror those already agreed for travel to the EU from outside the bloc. The bloc reached a deal earlier this month on digital certificates that will show via a QR code whether a person has received a vaccine, had a recent negative test, or has immunity based on recovery from an infection. The scheme should be ready by July 1st. And London police have busted a huge money laundering operation. That's after watching a man struggle to carry bags full of cash. Detectives saw the man lugging bags from an apartment to a car in June of last year. They stopped him and found a considerable amount of cash. A search of the apartment uncovered more cash, about $7 million in all. On top of that, nearly $60,000 was discovered at another address. Three men pleaded guilty to conspiracy and other charges. They were sentenced Friday, receiving between one and three years in prison. The bust is the largest cash amount ever seized by London's police force. And thousands of demonstrators marched through London on Saturday to protest against lockdowns and vaccine passports. Many traveled from across the country to take part in the Unite for Freedom rally. NTD's Jane Worrell was on the ground in London. The people here are protesting against vaccine passports and the lockdowns. Some of the people I've spoken to have said that it's the biggest one yet. Placards ranged from no to mandatory vaccines to experimental vaccines kill, resist the Great Reset and no more lockdowns. All the people here don't necessarily say that COVID doesn't exist. They know it exists, but they just they don't believe or agree with what the government are doing, like locking us down, forcing us to have jabs that are like haven't even the, t- the tested, the trials haven't even finished until 2023. People also told me they've had the vaccine themselves, but they don't agree with mandatory vaccinations. Typically, have all of my vaccinations, uh, so do my children. But um, vaccination by coercion, vaccine passports, uh, trampling on our human rights—that's where we, a lot of people, you know, normal, you know, all sorts of people from all sorts of walks of life. I think professionals, you know, we're professionals, and um, yeah. <laughs> We may not agree on everything, but, you know, that's kind of, uh, that's my perspective anyway. Doesn't it just make us China? I mean, we, we in, every day in the press is criticized China's social, you know, uh, monitoring and tracking system. And yet there's constituents here in this country that want to bring that in. I mean, what's the separation at that point? I think we're more about, you know, the right to not be tracked by government and big state. I think we're in the, you know, the history of the Anglo-Saxon culture is individual rights and freedoms. The UK government had initially ruled out using vaccine passports or COVID status certificates, but the government started to review the idea in February and started trials in April. Last week, Michael Gove said it's unlikely the scheme would be used in pubs and bars, but they could have a role to play in nightclubs. 
The Heritage Party leader took part in the protest and said he's against the lockdowns. They're saying that they're going to give back our freedom on June the 21st. Well, it's not the government to say they give back our freedom. It's not theirs to take away in the first place. And if they don't give it all back, uh, which is they're indicating that they will do, I think we're here to say we are not going to accept that. And our business has been Tony, who used to be a market business. trader, said his business was uh, forced to close business. during the pandemic and he started to drive for a living. When they started the lockdowns and they, people just weren't allowed to do things like, you know, like we should be, um, we had to stop doing what we were doing. And as a result of that, I had to take something else, you know, I had to take another job. The protests were largely peaceful, but the Met Police said a small minority threw objects at officers. Later, a small breakaway group occupied the Westfield Shopping Centre in Shepherd's Bush. Police said a small number of officers were assaulted. If the Prime Minister's roadmap goes to plan, all legal limits on social restrictions will end on June 21st. Jane Werrell, NTD News, London. In the age of emails and text messages, it's rare to receive a handwritten letter in the post. But the tradition of putting pen to paper has an enduring appeal. We'll hear more from Jane Wirrell, who found out how the simple act of writing a letter can change people's lives. After learning that her friend Brian was diagnosed with bowel cancer, Alison offered to write him letters to cheer him up. I thought, oh God, what have I done? I've offered to write letters to a man who's got cancer, and I said they'd be funny, and what's funny about cancer? And, um, but I thought, well, he's got cancer, all I've got to do is write a letter. The letters kept Brian going throughout his treatments. He used to save them for when he had chemotherapy. When Alison's letter arrived, if I'd been on my own during, on my own that day, that really changed the day because suddenly I had something to hold, something to open, you know, something to really connect with. I really didn't really expect Alison to really keep her part of the bargain and write the letter. You know, those letters went on for two and a half years, so she had to continually find new material, and I didn't write back, so it wasn't a pen pal arrangement here. But Alison found beauty in putting pen to paper. He really got to know me much quicker and in a far different way than perhaps if we just met in a pub for a drink and I think that he got to know me in a more real way so he he really found out what I was about and I think that's what letters allow people to be you can really be your true self. Brian recovered from cancer and they became best friends. They started a charity, From Me to You, that encourages people to write letters to friends and family who are suffering with cancer. People can also anonymously donate a letter. That a lot of people don't know what to say or what to do when somebody's diagnosed with cancer. And for this, it's a way that you can easily get over yourself and sort of do it. Even if it's just a card to say, I'm thinking of you, or a postcard to say that, the recipient knows that at that point you were in their mind. It was almost like she was journaling and I was the privileged person who got to read them. They say to keep it simple and from the heart. Just don't mention it, just talk about the things that we've all got in common. And, and remember that it's the real mundane things that actually are the things that connect us all together. Brian and Alison say the hardest part of starting to write a letter is the opening sentence, but once you've got going, the words will flow. Jane Werrell, NTD News, London. Electric bikes can help people get from A to B without breaking a sweat. One London company specialises in making and selling kits to convert even the most ancient piece of pedal power to electric. NTD's Neil Woodrow went to try it out. Electric bikes have been gaining popularity since the 1990s. A British company called Switch can help you convert your personal two wheels into an e-bike. The London-based tech startup is the creative force behind the Switch e-bike kit. We visited the company to learn more about their product and story from their CEO, co-founder and inventor of their e-bike kit. Um, the idea came about because I used to sell all manner of electric bike kits and I was looking for one kit that would work on any bike. Uh, I looked for a few years, didn't find it and then had the epiphany uh, that if I could fit all of the components of an electric bike into one little power pack that fit onto the handlebars like this, it would work on any bike. And uh, here we are. So, 
After the original idea in 2017, they launched a successful crowdfunding campaign. Uh, two years later, we re-engineered the kit to make it significantly smaller and lighter. They cut its weight by half to less than 1.5 kilograms, keeping its power at 250 kilowatts, the legal limit for electric bikes. On average, it will achieve 16 miles per hour and 31 miles distance on a single charge. The kit acts as an aid to your own cycling power. Turning the power up will assist your pedalling more. Oliver says it's a very simple routine to fit the kit. Uh, pretty much anyone can do it themselves at home. Uh, you only need two tools, a spanner and an Allen key. First, you lose the original wheel. The new powered switch wheel is tightened on. The wheel is ordered to match the original size. Then the handlebar bracket is fixed where the power pack will be fitted. The power wheel is connected and the power pack fitted in place. And then the wheel is powered. Sales of the e-bike kit have been going well. Well, in 2020, we helped over 20,000 new customers turn their bikes into electric switch bikes. And we're forecasting at least 30,000 this year in 2021. I asked Montague if the pandemic has helped his business. The cycling market is growing extremely fast. I'm sure that lockdown helped to kickstart some behaviour and uh, get more people cycling, but we believe this is only the start of a cycling revolution and we're forecasting significant further growth in the next 10 years. He says his turnover has grown exponentially over the last three years. The kit's standard retail price starts at £1,000, about half that of your average good quality electric bike. So, does this kit fit any bike? If your bike has a wheel and handlebars, the switch kit will fit. Even a penny farthing? Even a penny farthing, yes. <laughs> Here you have it, a switch penny farthing. Wow, but I'm in a suit. OK, good point. I have just the thing for you. So now we've learned all about the switch e-bike, I'm going to ride one. Neil Woodrow, NTD News, London. Just ahead, a stable in Russia takes in old horses and gives them a better life. Some surpass their life expectancy by decades. And that's all thanks to the way they're treated. And a Washington state man finds a giant diamond for his homemade engagement ring. Find out more in just a moment here on NTD News. Listen, you're my friend. I noticed you haven't really been yourself recently. Yeah, I feel like something's up. How are you? Are you okay? Is there anything you want to talk about? I just want to know how you're feeling. And listen, even if you don't know what to say, I'm here to talk. No matter what you're going through, I just want you to know I'm here. I've got your back. When you want to talk, I'm here. A stable in Russia is giving old horses a new lease of life. Named Freedom, it tends to the needs of nine horses daily. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the story. The gate to this paddock is opened each morning and the horses can freely enjoy the pastures practically all day. The shelter is called Freedom and aims to give horses a better quality of life than being confined to stables all day. They have helped man and work in the household. Why should we give them away somewhere? Let them just walk and have a rest until the last graze. One of the owners has been passionate about horses since childhood and opened her first horse stable in 2014. 
but it wasn't originally intended for elderly animals. Looking to improve the conditions for the horses, they moved the sanctuary to this current location in central Russia. The horse shelter began to attract other horse breeders, who would bring their retired horses that could no longer continue their normal life. We have horses with different problems. Some have problems with their legs, some have stomach problems, some with heart problems, and in some cases with the brain. It's feeding time. As well as hay, horses are fed cereals. Each horse receives its own food diet, depending on the horse and on its load. In addition to their own five horses, they take care of nine more horses for other people who pay 9,000 rubles per month, which is about $120. That covers the horse's nutrition. In natural conditions, horses can live more than 40 years. In the stables, they barely live up to 20 years. So those owners who want to extend the life of their pets can arrange for them, so to say, a free life. Some of the horses brought here were expected to live no longer than a year, but are still alive and kicking. Arian Pastar, NTD News. A Washington state man's dream of creating his own engagement ring for his future bride is coming true. It's all thanks to a very lucky find. 26-year-old Christian Leiden panned for gold in his home state, and after five years, he had enough to make the band. Then it was time to look for the diamond, so he drove out to Arkansas's Crater of Diamonds State Park to find the rock. After three days in Arkansas using his own homemade mining equipment, he turned up a 2.2 carat yellow diamond. It's the largest that has been found at the park since last October when a visitor found a 4.5 carat yellow diamond. Back home, Leiden pulled out the diamond to propose and his girlfriend said yes. Next, they say they just need a jeweler to bond the elements together forever. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. We have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source.